What are the key concepts and the main ideas of the book The Great Narrative? Hi everyone, my name is Johannes and welcome to this channel where I share my learnings and experiences and thoughts from my life and my career as a strategy consultant and on this channel we talk about consulting, business and mindset. And if you're new to this channel then please make sure to subscribe to it, also leave a thumb up, this will help you that you don't miss any new video here on this channel. And today we will do a book summary of the book The Great Narrative. And a couple of weeks ago, I think it was actually last week, um, I published a video about a book called The Great Reset. And this was a book uh, from the World Economic Forum written by Klaus Schwab and Thierry Mallory. And this book is actually writ or was written um, when the COVID pandemic really, really became big. It was in 2020 and the book talked about, you know, potential implications, especially on the macro level. So what impact uh, COVID will have on like, you know, the economy, on the society, technology, um, environment and so on. And this book, The Great Narrative is so to say the follow up two years later. So it, you know, um, um, is linked to many ideas from the first book from the great reset but it's like an updated version because we have much more information now uh, about how the COVID pandemic really turned out and so this is a kind of follow-up and it also tries you know to tell a story what the future might look like and today i want to do a summary and talk about the main ideas and main concepts as always, we start with some background information. So the book is called The Great Narrative for a Better Future, written by Klaus Schwab and Thierry Mallorit, and both work for the World Economic Forum and was written in 2022. So this year actually acquired a new book. When it got out, I immediately bought it because I really, really liked the first one. And um, at the end of this video, I will do a rating so that you know if I really like this book as much as I like the first one. The book is structured um, the following way. So you have chapter one. This is the introduction. Here they talk about some um, risk and systematic um, connectivity. Sounds complicated, but at the end of the day, um, those are some uh, yeah, macro trends that they see. Just a summary and we'll talk about it in a second. Then they also talk about social media and fake news, very interesting, and also the power of narratives. So here they explain a little bit what the book is all about, why narratives are so important, and what the purpose of the book actually is. Then chapter two is actually like the, the core, the heart of the book. And there again, like in the first one, they go through the um, single macro categories like economics, um, environment, geopolitics, society, and technology and talk about trends and implications they see, um, especially after COVID and for the next years. And then the third section, and this is really my favorite section of the book, and I really, really like it because it's, uh, that's you know different to the first book that they wrote, um, The Great Narrative, at a great reset. It's a great advancement here because they actually talk about solutions. They propose some of the solutions, like for example, collaboration and cooperation, imagination and innovation, morality and values, public policies, resilience, role of businesses, and technology progress. Again, we will talk about that in a second, but those are the three chapters of the book. What I want to do now is that I go through each of those chapters and summarize and really highlight the main ideas of the book to give you the entire knowledge, not the entire knowledge, but you know, the main thesis of the book in a very compromised way. So they start with an introduction and this is where they talk like um, about the major um, development that they see. And obviously similar to the book The Great Reset, they see an increasing interdependence of global events. So this at the end means that, you know, areas or, you know, um, categories like technology, like environment, like economics become more and more connected. They also say that um, there is an increased uh, velocity. So this means uh, events happen faster and faster. And it's also becoming more and more complex because you have so many 
aspects, so many events on a global level that impact each other. <clears throat> then they also talk about, <coughs> pardon, they also talk about social media and fake news. And obviously what they see is an increasing level of fake news. This is no surprise. What I thought was really interesting was that they highlight that there is a lack of discussion in the web because everyone, you know, based on the algorithms that you have on social media, uh, on the news pages, that you only get the information that you uh, basically agree upon. And this means that there is a lack of discussion. You know, back then you had to, like back then, I mean, my parents always tell me that, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you had like those newspapers where you had different opinions from different people and very controversial opinions and this forced you know the um, um the society to think about critical ideas now you all, uh, have access to all the knowledge but the thing is that the algorithms are programmed in a way that you only get the knowledge that you are interested in and you have a lot of confirmation bias at the end um, also you have access to ready-made groups of people this means that you have access to a very specific target group especially you know if you talk about social media targeting becomes very easy and this also helps you know to place messages very easily and then last but not least they also talk about the power of narratives and they say that narratives at the end help to understand the situation understand what uh, lies ahead so what the trends are and what needs to be done and what they did for the book was actually that they uh, made over 50 interviews with global th uh, thinkers mainly from think tanks from universities, uh, sometimes, you know, also from companies to, um, you know, discuss ideas and to create this book with the thesis. Also, they um, provided a conceptual framework. This is what I just talked about. So the interdependence, velocity and complexity. Uh, this is similar to the great narrative where they see, you know, that this is kind of the headline um, that is above all the macro trends that they see here. So with that being said, that was the introduction of the book and now let's go into the different topics. And they start again with economy. And what they say is um, that they for first uh, talk about growth. And obviously what we know now, what we didn't know uh, back then when we talked about the Great Reset is that we actually had a V-shaped recovery in the developed countries, so the OECD countries, but actually in the emerging countries that we didn't see any um, large recovery. Also what I highlight again is that future growth, uh, growth will not be as um, fast or as um, uh, promising as we had it in past years. So that uh, um, yeah, we, they often talk about the post growth era and that they see for the next decades. And what they also highlight and this actually is you know the preparation for um, the third book that they wrote um, stakeholder capitalism, they say that GDP is an inadequate measure to measure success. So you cannot only measure like the uh, output of a society, you also have to consider other, fac uh, other factors as well in order to say if a country or a society is successful or not. What they also see is that there is a huge um, uh, public um, debt level at the moment so that it's you know um, increasing across all the countries um, over the past years that it's really, really huge and i saw a graphic once when i read the book um, uh, big debt cycles from ray dalio and we are at a debt level that is similar to world war one and in this book um, big debt cycles um, ray dalio also talks about those you know large cycles and every time where the debt ratio is so um, large also huge then you know um, significant global events can happen and this is also something that um, that uh, you know the world economic forum sees here then they also talk about um, and the results of lower growth and high debt and what they see is that they see a, a bigger split between the developed countries and the emerging countries they see obviously you all know that now uh, inflation this is mainly based on the money printing that we had in 2020 then uh, they also say okay in order to maintain or to increase productivity we really need technology so it's really really hard to do it otherwise and um, because you know there won't be a growing demand in a certain uh, for certain goods i mean obviously in some niches yes there will be but in the overall big picture they don't assume that there will 
you know, um, uh, increase consumption, but they rather say that the productivity has to come through efficiency gains based on digitization. And very interestingly, um, they also see that there will be a emergence of crypto. So they will, um, they, you know, expect or expect a certain competition between established national currencies and digital currencies. So cryptocurrencies, very, very interesting. Then the next bucket and the next macro category they talk about is the environment. And what they say is, okay, um, first of all, we, they recognize that there is a kind of inability to um, create an action plan. And this means that, you know, obviously for 50 years now, global warming is known. So there was the Club of Rome report, I think in the, in the 70s. And since then, you know, it's very, very well known that global warming is actually happening. And still, you know, the question is, why do we still fall short? Why do we not come up with any solutions? Why is it so difficult to really implement uh, measures that really help to, um, you know, um, reduce CO2 emissions and move the entire world towards a um, more sustainable world? And they say, okay, there are several reasons for the slow progress. So first of all, they say the incentivation, um, so the, the incentives are really, really bad. We don't have a incentive system in place that actually works. Also, they say, okay, there is not enough investment. So there is not enough money in the market. Then they say, okay, it's also a problem of free riding. Free riding means that, you know, one economy, maybe one country is very ambitious and all of the others uh, benefit from it. So this means we have no global incentive that really, you know, um, uh, makes countries uh, do the necessary things that they need to do in order to become more successful, uh, more sustainable, because they also benefit, you know, if anyone else does the work. Also, they say, you know, it's difficult to implement measures and they say it's, you know, gets very quickly down to nitty gritty discussions and negotiations, because obviously if you want to implement rules or global uh, rules for sustainability there are many interests involved uh, involved and even large decisions can make a huge impact on certain companies certain industries so this means you know there's a lot of lobbying uh, going on obviously and this also slows down the progress and uh, also the all uh, the entire topic around uh, climate justice um is perceived as you know being kind of unfair because you know it's really the question like especially compared to the emerging markets there's always the question you know who has now to compensate is it you know the developed countries do they have to uh, you, you know really cut emissions what about emerging countries what about china you know really raising but compared to europe for example especially in the past they had less emissions so the big question is you know how can you make a global system global regulation that is really um, uh, justified and uh, justice for everyone. Then what they also say is that there are six specific actions that they see that they need to be uh, that they see to that need to be done. Sorry. And the first thing is that they see okay that we need a significant and rapid reduction in methane emissions. Also, they see that we need to halt deforestation. Obviously, that we need to stop cutting down the rainforest and trees. Also, they want to see the decarbonization of power sector and the acceleration of phasing out coal. So we see first steps here already, especially in Germany. Then uh, also the acceleration of electrifying the road transport, like uh, we saw with uh, firms like Tesla. Also, all the huge automotive uh, firms you know, uh, have huge uh, electrified um, uh, vehicle programs, obviously. Then also the supply decarbon uh, decarbonization in buildings, heavy industry and heavy transport, a huge topic. And also they say, okay, um, that we um, need uh, to increase resource efficiency in order to achieve our goals. And as we just said, the entire topic around climate injustice is also something that they address in a separate um, paragraph where they say, okay, you know, we need to find a way to solve the conflict between emerging countries and um, developed countries in terms of um, environment protection. Good. Then the next topic is geopolitics that they talk about. 
And this is similar to what we had in the Great Reset, actually. So um, there is an increasing rivalry between the US and China. Um, also, this is, uh, is kind of very interesting. Two comments that they make is that the conflict uh, has potential, you know, to generate repercussions. So to take a step back and we had, you know, huge progress on an international level in terms of um, international organizations, in terms of um, peace. Uh, in terms of um, you know uh, sustainable development as well uh, in an economic sense and uh, this conflict between you know the east and the west has a huge potential you know to take a step back like we see also in um, europe with russia um, you know um, fighting against ukraine uh, i mean this is on a global perspective a step back and they see the uh, rivalry between china and us has even more potential to do that also, and this is also very interesting, is that all the um, they say that all the global problems we have, like um, like economic, uh, like uh, inequalities, or like uh, you know um, environment protection, it can't be done without having the U.S. and China on the same table because both powers, both countries, are both nations are so powerful that in terms of um, CO2 reduction, for example, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't help anyone if we only have the US following some rules and China not or vice versa. We need both sides on the table to solve the conflict. The big question is, how will this dispute, how will this rivalry resolve? And unfortunately, what they say is that most projections are very bearish. And they say the reason for that is that there is no real incentive for both parties to back down. And if you read the, um, the book from Ray Dalio, um, I think it's uh, Why Big Nations Fail. It's the name of the book. Uh, there he talks about empires and the rise and fall of empires. And there he really suggests that um, the US, and this is obviously the same opinion that um, the World Economic Forum has, that the US is more on a decline uh, in terms of its power, in terms of its uh, hegemony, uh, in a world, um, in a global um, um, uh, arena, and that, you know, China is obviously rising. And they say, the World Economic Forum says that the US has the task to manage, you know, this down, um, um, this uh, decline as gently as possible. And this means, obviously, that the US has no incentive to really back down against China because, you know, they uh, still need their um, economic power, they still have their uh, military power, and obviously, you know, they want to make this uh, decline uh, in power as gentle as possible and as slow as possible. Uh, on the other hand, you have China. And, you know, if you take a look at the history of China, China was always like uh, a huge global power, very, very developed. And then you had like, um, I think it's called the, the Chinese winter or something like that, where they, you know, especially in the um, 20th century, where they really, really lost uh, in power they became, you know, almost uh, irrelevant at some point. And what they think, and this is, this is kind of in their mindset, that they have, you know, the, the, the right or, you know, a kind of uh, position in the global um, economy, in the global um, uh, landscape that they want to reclaim. And this is also, you know, obviously there are many good reasons for China to stay on that path and to stay ambitious because, um, you know, the numbers speak for itself. And, um, you know, obviously they want to challenge the US. And those two positions make it very unlikely that at the moment one of those two powers backs up and uh, backs down. And this really, you know, uh, leaves us only to hope that there won't be a military conflict, that, you know, there will be a kind of um, coexistence between the two, because otherwise, you know, obviously this can be a huge threat for everyone. Then they also talk about society. And uh, what they remark is that the biggest challenge that they see is inequality. And they say that COVID-19 accelerated um, pre-existing conditions, so it made inequalities even worse. Especially the working class was exposed to many risks, to many, you know, um, also um, uh, dangers, actually. I mean, we saw it in the... In the um, um, in the tourism uh, sector, we saw it, you know, with uh, the, the gastro uh, economy, uh, uh, sorry, how do you say it, the restaurants and so on. 
So this means there is actually, you know, um, it was working class who suffered. It was not like um, the middle or, you know, the upper class that suffered during COVID. It was the working class and this, you know, makes, um, uh, makes, makes the situation even worse. And one important thing to mention is, you know, that the important thing is not how inequalities between countries are. It's more how inequalities are within a country because, um, you know, the frustration of people usually comes when they see that people within their country um, are much, much better off than they are. And this usually is the point where there will be a lot of demonstrations. There will be, you know, social unrest and there will be, you know, a general, um, a, 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 you know, lack of trust in the institutions. And this is, you know, what they also call this social contract. So the co social contract between the government and the population that this is kind of eroded, that there is no trust anymore. And what they suggest, what a new social contract should include is a broader universal provision of social assistance, social insurance, healthcare, basic quality services. So they say, you know, if the working class cannot take care of its own uh, on its own, and that, you know, government needs to intervene and provide more services that are affordable. Also that, you know, uh, we need more protection of the workers, especially in the context of digitization and automation, that we need, you know, more minimum wages, help to adapt to new trends and also some benefits. And uh, on the same time, you know, because those are more like um, uh, uh, left uh, initiatives, that at the same time you still strengthen the liberties and the freedom of the individual so that you don't have like um you know um a big brother government that takes care of everything but you at the, that you at the same time make sure that everyone can keep its his or her individual rights and freedoms and also what i see and this is something that i think we all can confirm is that the new generation will be a bit more radical because actually if we talk about things like climate change those are the, or this is the generation that is really affected. I think, you know, my generation is also affected, but especially the younger ones, the generation below me, um, I feel that there is, you know, a lot of drive, you know, to become more sustainable and to change something. Then last but not least, they also talk about technology. They say, of course, you know, technology might be the solution for many things, but they also see many risks involved. They highlight three areas where they see a big risk, especially in cyber and security. So that, you know, this is obviously a huge topic because not every, and not only every individual, also companies, institutions, you know, everyone actually has weaknesses and is exposed to cyber criminality. And this is obviously a huge danger. Also AI and warfare. So, you know, AI based um, weapons are already existing and in use and it's really really hard to get the governments aligned on a global regulation and a ban of those weapons because there are so many different interests involved and also they see a synthetic um, um synthetic sorry synthetic and biology as a huge problem because it's very expensive and this can lead to a two-class society where only the rich ones can afford to make use of those technologies and where there might be some discrimination um, based on your um, gene material, for example, or even worse, um, oil genics. Okay, and this is some; uh, those are some risks that they see. But on the other hand, they also see many important technologies that might have a huge impact on the um, advancement, uh, and also, you know, a huge impact or it could be a, a large cont uh, contributor to the solution of all the problems that we just mentioned. And for example, this could be automation, so RPA, IoT, additive manufacturing, then, you know, 5G and IoT in terms of the future of connectivity, also distribution infrastructure like cloud or edge computing, then next-gen computing, so quantum or neuromorphing computing, then obviously artificial intelligence, they call it applied AI, has also a huge impact. Then the future of software, it's AI-supported coding at the end, what they call software 2.0, then trust and architecture, which means distributed lectures or blockchain technologies, uh, bioevolution, so the mixture or you know the collaboration between biology, computing, automation, and AI. Then they also see that next generation materials might have a huge impact, and obviously clean technologies like smart energy and energy storages. Also, they are very important and can be a big 
part of the solution for many problems. So talking about solutions, what are the solutions that the economic forum um, um, the World Economic Forum actually sees for all of these problems. And I want to highlight again, you know, that this is something that I really like because uh, in the first book, The Great um, Reset, they talk more about the situation, the problems, and here they really make very concrete suggestions what we can do in order to solve the problems. And the first thing that they highlight is that we need an increase in collaboration and cooperation because they say all of the problems are now on a global level they are all very, very complex. So the only way to deal with those problems is if we collaborate across countries, across areas, across uh, you know um, uh, expertises, so that we really need those interdisciplinary teams to work and to solve those problems. The second point that they ma uh, mention is that imagination and innovation becomes more important because the um, issues that we face, the challenges that we face are so huge and so complex that we need a lot of imagination and um, innovation in order to tackle them. So thinking big and thinking outside the box, uh, being visionary is more important than ever. Also, they say that we need to place morality and values at the core of our doing, especially in terms of uh, you know um, the economic system, institutions. We come from a world where, um, you know, especially if you study um, economics, where this is almost like a math, uh, you know, study uh, program because it's so mathematical, it's so numbers driven. And um, this is also something that I experienced, you know, during my studies. It's, you know, not a discussion that you have in a classroom about values, about, you know, how it should be. It's more like that you calculate what impact has what on what, like if we, you know, would, would work in a, um, uh, in a, you know, scientific environment, uh, but, you know, it's behavioral science and it's not physics. So this is also something that um, the World Economic Forum sees and they uh, you know, uh, want to see more morality and value-based discussions in economic discussions. Then they talk about uh, public policies and they say that you know, the biggest goal of every government should be um, that we have or achieve social and environmental sustainabilities. And this means that we achieve um, the UN sustainability goals from 2015 and also the Paris Agreement. Then in terms of resilience, which they see as another point in part, uh, as a part of the solution, means that we adapt our system. So this means like, for example, that we um, strengthen our supply chains, chains that we have more capital buffers in, you know, uh, for example, if we talk about companies, if we talk about governments, that we really make sure that if there are some shocks like COVID again, that we are all better prepared. And also they see that, you know, we need um, as a society more resilience by having better systems in place that help to protect the weak in a society. Very interesting also is what they uh, think about, you know, the role of businesses. They have the thesis that uh, businesses need to move from a shareholder perspective to a stakeholder perspective. So away from a world where we only have profit for the shareholders as a measure of company success. They also want to see some ESG measures that um, measure the performance in terms of share, um, stakeholder value. Okay, so the contribution to, to society. And yeah, we will see how that turns out. And there is a book called Stakeholder Capitalism by Klaus Schwab as well. I would certainly do a preview about it uh, as well. So let's see what the main thesis there are. And of course, last but not least, they see also technology as a big part of the solution. They say that, you know, we need a lot of developments um, that help to tackle the challenges, but that we also need a lot of action, a lot of initiative, especially, you know, from politics, industry leaders, investors, but also the society in terms of regulation and so on in order to solve those challenges. Good. So this was the content summary. Um, let's talk at the end of this video a little bit about what I liked, what I didn't like, and then I will make a overall rating. So what I really, really liked, and this is similar to um, the previous book, is that it provides a great overview of the macro developments. And I really like this because in consulting, you very often have to do um, environmental analysis where you have to check out, okay, what kind of economic trends do we have? What kind of social technological trends do we have? And this is really a good foundation 
that helps you at least for the next one or two years to summarize all the developments that are out there. It's also again, you know, written in a very structured way. So this is also something that I really liked, especially as a consultant. And um, what I really um, enjoyed was the kind of optimistic view that they have and uh, suggestions uh, for solutions, because this is something that I missed in the book, The Great Reset. And now they finally also propose some solutions. What did I not like? I think, you know, at some point they have very ideologic views where I'm not sure how realistic they really are, especially in terms of collaboration, in terms of say, uh, sustainability, also the shift between stakeholder and shareholder um, uh, capitalism. I'm not sure, I'm not exactly sure if that will work out or how it should work out. So I think, you know, that some of the discussions are very idealistic, but you know, probably that's the, the way where you have to, or the point where you have to start a discussion. And um, yeah, what I also see is that they have very um, yeah, left views, uh, especially in terms of, um, of uh, solutions for our problems that we have. Um, so I kind of missed uh, the, the right perspective. So uh, like more the focus on the individual, uh, individual, because almost everything what they propose is that we need more overarching regulation, more overarching um, um, uh, support systems. And this really goes away. So this is a very left oriented um, um, uh, um, suggestion at the end. And I miss kind of, you know, the contrarian view on a more individualistic um, centered viewpoint. So the right viewpoint, that's my opinion. So I kind of, you know, am, I am personally always in the middle or try to be there, but I just see that, you know, that this is a very left oriented argumentation without having too much from the right side. Good. But now the big question, the interesting question, how much stars would I give? We have five stars. How much would I give? And I again would give five stars. And the reason for that is that I really, really like the way they uh, think about those uh, macro trends. I really, really like that, you know, in this book, they also talked about solutions. So I can highly recommend to read it. If you had to decide between reading the great reset and reading the great narrative, I would probably read the great narrative because it's, you know, just more up to date and many ideas are similar. Plus on the great narrative, you also have some solutions you can think about. Good. With that being said, of course, I'm interested what you think about the book. So please leave it in the comments down below. With that being said, if you liked it, then please subscribe to this channel. Leave a thumb up. This will help you that you don't miss any new video here. And with that being said, I wish you a very successful day. Hope to talk to you soon. Goodbye. Johannes.